This is episode 134 of the XY podcast with Amanda Kasser. It's one thing to recognize financial abuse, yet it's another to know how to handle it, especially as an advisor. So does your licensee have resources in place to help when you see signs of financial abuse? Or if you're self-licensed, do you have a strategic plan in place to support yourself and your team when dealing with clients who may be a victim to financial abuse? Amanda Kassa is the director and advisor behind Wealth Planning Partners and Trusted Aged Care Services. She's a total XY legend who thinks globally but acts locally. She was the energetic MC at our XY on tour event in the Gold Coast last month as well. And she's super passionate about raising financial literacy levels. So much so that she is putting together a course for the XY training platform on financial abuse. In this episode, Amanda explains how she came to be so involved in financial abuse. She highlights the warning signs of financial abuse and what advisors can do when they recognize financial abuse in a client's circumstances. It's a short and sweet episode, and we really hope you enjoy. This podcast is brought to you by Salesforce, blaze new trails to richer client relationships with the world's number one CRM. Salesforce has designed the Financial Services Cloud to help you make every interaction personalized through rich client profiles centered on personal goals and pivotal life events. You can nurture deeper relationships with proactive tracking and event alerts that remind you to reach out when clients need you the most. Supercharge your productivity by managing client engagements, household relationships, and financial life goals all from the one connected platform. It's the world's number one CRM imagined just for wealth management. Salesforce is excited to partner with XY Advisor to discuss how you can build richer client relationships and unlock loyalty. Miss Amanda Kassar. Yes, tis me, tis I. <laughs> it's good to have you on. Thank you. We had, a, we had a, this is post the event we had last night. Yeah, it was, was a great pretty, event, the XY yeah. on tour, uh, kicking off on the GC. It was great. Oh, Queensland is so much fun. There's, we had some good characters on the on the panel. We I, the, did great. I would say uh, the the uh, MC was a bit more of a character than oh, some well, of the yeah. panels. <laughs> <laughs> Do my best. <laughs> it was um, yeah, it was a great session. Digital digital businesses and micro niches. Micro niches. Yeah. Everyone, I'm there going shit. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Fascinating. Mm, good it stuff. Is, it is very fascinating. But yourself, Amanda, what's been happening? What are you What are you been up to? We. Mm. Lots. I saw you. Yeah, there's a there's some good um, speaking gigs last year at the FBA conference. And... Yeah, that was great. Enjoyed that. Um, MDRT in LA last year and mm. MDRT in Florida this year. I'm speaking at next month. So, so is MDRT that. is that that really gets you going? What, what does it give you? The XY doesn't. Uh, global. <laughs> okay. So when you Note take taken. XY, <laughs> working so, on it. Yeah, <laughs> great idea. Um, MDRT is just the. I I think I love it mostly because there's no hidden agenda. I'm not going to go and hear about phase year and the Royal Commission. It's a global network of advisors who are all about giving back to the profession yeah. and sharing their tips from around the world and how they do things, make them work. So I just love that collaboration. So what's not to love about? You yeah. know, well, top I, minds around the world sharing their stuff. All the, all the advisors I know that get involved, they're all good peeps. So yeah. oops, they must, a lot there of must be something in it. And it's a trip to America every year to meet up with all your colleagues and friends. So yeah, totally. That's a good thing. Absolutely. And, and your business, where whereabouts are you based? Your uh, Gold from? Coast at a place Gold called Rabina. Ah, so, yeah. yeah. Rabina Town Centre. Just I look over the town centre. Nice those yeah. those lakes that they've got there. Yeah, that's, that's... it's in waterfront place. There's a little trickle of water out the back with mm. the swans and the ducks and the water hens. So it's lovely. And have you always been on the Gold Coast? Yes. Born and bred Queenslander, fourth generation. So there's not many of them around. Mm. So, yes. Always been on the GC. And I'm guessing Maroon supporter. That's a... Of course. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's some people that like to fight the tide. They no, are. no. Look, Even we... though they lost? like. Yeah. Well, we just thought it's about time we gave you a chance, really. It was just getting boring, winning all the time. So That's needed fair. some life in it. Oh, it seemed like you guys were getting a bit desperate. Ask someone talking about Cameron Smith. Trying to get pay more to come back, and I'm, I'm sensing I can't a bit of fear. I'm having a conversation about football. Sense, sensing a bit of fear here, Amanda. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, back to financial planning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we um, we had a great conversation at the FBA conference, and you've been working on um, sharing a bit of that um, about elder abuse and financial abuse in yeah. general. It's um, I think it's a space that a lot of advisors maybe don't necessarily understand completely because they haven't, and it's a good thing, they haven't come into direct contact with it or haven't maybe been aware of it going on because mm. it's not always readily apparent. Like, no, that's right, absolutely. Mm. So I only became aware of it when I really started, I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, Financial Secrets Revealed, and one of the women I interviewed in that was a victim of financial abuse mm-hmm. and shared her story. Her name was Tanya Target. She was an amazing lady, brilliant career in the media, walked into a relationship with property, money in the bank, and crawled out of that relationship, emotionally broken, had a stroke, um, nothing. She had to stash $20 a week Coles vouchers at a girlfriend's place wow. so that she'd have money when she left to feed her daughter for a couple of months. So wow. it just, I suppose it blew my mind. It opened my eyes. I had no idea that, you know, it was so far out of anything mm. I'd ever been exposed to that it just um, made me start digging a bit more into financial abuse and seeing that it's a lot more prevalent than we think. And mm. yes, it does go then into the, most of us have heard of elder abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, we often think of that as a, a physical sort of abuse mm. but the financial side of elder abuse is very dark and very disturbing mm. as well so and it's, it's very it's, it's not very women. evident like it's no just, no it's not it's a very subtle lot of the activity that goes on and mm. i recently had a client come in who was telling me about her partner and he's just a young man and i would say he's financially abused by his family um he's had to gift them cars they run up huge bills in fines that they then make him pay um, and his, I suppose, way of doing it is he wants to make more money so that he can help support them. So, mm. you know, we, we often come from a really beautiful place, mm. not realising that we have to set these boundaries and limitations, mm. and, and that's something that comes with age and experience. But, you know, it's... You get in that cycle, and women, it's sort of... Yeah, it's elderly, it's young, there's no barriers for financial abuse, so it's it's a really interesting space to explore. What, what have you learned on how to sort of pick it up a bit more in terms of now that you understand more about it? What are some of the signs that... Um, if you've got a couple in front of you, usually one will do the talking and one will be quite um, suppressed or quiet or not allowed to contribute. Okay. Um, I did a little slot on a local radio station here for the oldies and was talking about financial abuse. And I actually didn't know when it was going to air but boy, did I know when it had, because they would all ring the station, ask for my number, and all these oldies were ringing up going, actually, I think I've got a problem with financial abuse. My daughter-in-law's my power of attorney. She's closed my bank account. She's taking my pension. Oh. And these stories were just pouring in all afternoon. I was almost in tears by the time I left for the day, just um, hearing how prevalent it was yeah. and just frightening that it's it's usually our loved ones that are taking advantage as well. That mm. It nearly always is, because mm. they've got the access and the um, the emotional abuse goes along with it. Yeah. So so obviously, like it's a it's a pretty. Like, is it getting covered in like they've got the aged care um, royal the commission, commission going? Is it part of? Is it in the scope at all? As part it is. of that, it yeah. is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the physical abuse that takes part in the homes is more the focus, and mm. the aged care facilities what they're doing. I I think the aged care homes are going to have to be a lot more aware and open to the fact that it does happen and need mm. to know. Not only advisors, but the facilities, they can usually tell when something's well, not quite they're right. Present they're present there. They're on the front. Mm. So, you know, if somebody's coming in and running off with the checkbook or, you know, suddenly Bill can't pay his fees, but there was money in the bank or the pension's not coming in. Totally. You know, they're the ones who are going to know. So I think it's on advisors and any in, you know, that working space with the mm. elderly or others who, when they find it, work out, what's our strategy? What, mm. what do we do what now that we've yeah. seen it? So... Um, there is an aged care hotline okay. in Australia that you can report both financial and physical abuse. So okay. worth looking that up. Yep. And look, sometimes the option is to do nothing. Okay. Which is that- sounds really strange, but often the person involved doesn't want their loved one to be in trouble. And mm. look, it can be as severe as fraud mm. that they're ripping them off. Yeah. Another one is to let them know that you've seen it and that you're aware of it and you'd like to monitor the situation. Because often they won't like to talk about it or discuss it. And they being might self, a victim of abuse. Self-adjust um, off the back of that? Or? Perhaps, yeah. So it's a 
super sensitive area. But even when with um, physical abuse now, the case in Australia of uh, Alison Baden Clay was the biggest murder story in um, Queensland a few years ago, where the husband had killed his wife. Um, dumped her in the river wrapped in a carpet and then you know said he didn't know where she was and that story started with financial abuse yeah. of her and the family have started that campaign now just say something okay so all over tv and that there's a hashtag just say something yeah so you and is that up that's to for a the broader victim, audience that's for the broader, um, broader populace yeah. yeah and that's you know we've now got the domestic violence campaigns on tv where if you hear this shouting yelling screaming mm. you know go and have a t- chat to the victim because if it's becoming more mainstream mm. then you know, it's hopefully going to bring it into the spotlight. We've got a horrific cases in Australia. You know, a woman dies every week at the hands of her, her partner mm. or more. So, is it is it just more um, identi- like it's identified more now, or is there an actual, or is it is it just that it's been this bad like I historically? Think it's been this bad forever, but and now it's that just we've now got, more evident. Yeah, digital social media, social media <laughs> like you can see the cries for help coming and through. And I think there. also the barriers are coming down. Whereas mm. it was one of those things it's not talked about, it's in the family. You know, often the family knew Auntie Betty was being belted, but they'd all just keep quiet because mm. it was a personal matter. Mm. You know, that, that doesn't cut it anymore. Actually, one of the beautiful stories I heard, I did a trip to India with the Hunger Project mm. earlier this year, and it was a trip where we met elected women leaders. So India has a quota system in government where at least 30% of the elected representatives have to be women. Mm -hmm. And not just women, they have to be from all four castes. So we're even talking about the untouchables have to be um, represented at a local government level. Is it equal representative? Yep. Yeah, wow. Yep, they're working towards 50% in some Because India is very strongly, like it's a significant issue. Like it's so deeply entrenched, that caste system. Yeah. And also that the women don't have a voice. Some of these women, mm. before they're elected, have never said their name publicly. They yeah, can't wow. identify India on a map or even where they live in India. Wow. So the lack of education as yeah. well. And these women that we'd met had been trained to step up into their roles, take on a bit of power, and the stories they were telling about uh, their villages and how they were helping women who were battered. Some of these women, as local councillor, would go and confront the men and tell them it wasn't acceptable. It's mm. still illegal in India to do it like it is everywhere else. Yeah, it's and just enforceability. And... Yeah, that she would go to the police if the situation continued. Mm. Uh, one lady decided she couldn't publicly help others until she sorted out her own house because she knew mm. her son was hitting his mm. wife. So I think the fact that now it's become much more okay to talk about it, mm. then it's being, you know... It's being brought into the spotlight. Mm. People are taking a stand that it's not acceptable. Yeah, I think it's the... I guess when you look at social media, like a lot of people get concerned around like uh, going about the political influences and the way that mass um, uh, mob media, like social media activity can can have bad effects. But I guess when it comes down to things like this, it's because it's so public, you can actually build quite good momentum around these causes because no one is sitting there going, that is acceptable. So no. it's, it's... I suppose the dark side of it is that now that the women are being believed a lot more and their stories are being heard, you know, as a mother with a son, I think it's frightening that some girls can come out and say, I've been hurt when mm. it hasn't happened. And yeah. so there is always a pendulum swing of too far. Oh. And any mother with sons, you know, you have to be so careful, even if they're not, you know, hurting a girl. If she turns around and changes her mind and said, actually, I don't think I was consenting, mm. you know, oh, so it's, it's, I played, it's frightening I played rugby for league and rugby union and there's just, there's a lot of cases and, and, yeah. and it goes both ways. It's Absolutely. sort of, but it's just, I think it's, it's just that importance for critical thinking around all of it. It's, it is. And, and you know. It, the whole, you know, nobody asks to be raped or murdered. That's absolutely true. But mm. you still have responsibility for actions and putting yourself... Okay, walking home from a bus stop, you shouldn't have to be in fear for your life. Mm. You know, hanging out with a drunk rugby league team <laughs> maybe isn't a bright idea. So mm. whatever the situation, we do have personal responsibility mm. as well built in. Um, but again, nobody asks for these things to happen to us, whether it's, you know, physical violence, financial abuse, the whole lot. So. Well, it's interesting, Dan, um, how much it's become, like in Melbourne, it's really emerged as a like a Melbourne community sort of issue um, because you, I, I go down there a couple of times a year and you talk to people and it is because they've had... Love, Melbourne. What's that? <laughs> Melbourne's awesome. Oh, it's awesome. Love visiting Melbourne. Coffee, just in the beaches, <laughs> that's the only thing. Uh... St Kilda, there's Brighton. 
Yeah, it's not places. Gold Coast, but you know. <laughs> yeah, that's all right with a bit of mix of sewage in there. It's all good. That's, uh, my sister moved down there a couple of years ago, and um, yeah, she loves it, but she really misses the Sydney beaches. It's, okay, uh, that's yeah. understandable. Yeah, it's, uh, but but the because of those incidents that they've had down there, it's, it is a much more prev- like it's a much it's a, it's there's a lot of like they've had the marches, they've had yep. Sydney doesn't quite. I think it, a lot of that gets lost in Sydney. It's, it doesn't hasn't built that um, sort of. There's a few movements around. in Australia that are sort of followed on the back of the Me Too movement mm. in the states. It all sort of seemed to blow apart when the Harvey Weinstein case broke, and everything yeah. sort of, you know, started hitting the fan from there. So Tracy Spicer in Australia has yeah. started a movement over here. The women's agenda is very supportive. Mm-hmm. So you can look on those okay. for cases and stories. There's there's a lot that they put out every week on on what's going on in that space. So. Yeah, is is there? Um, I guess like, is it national? Are these national groups that are sort of getting yes, together? Yes, absolutely. And, okay. and um, when Tracy put out the call, like in Australia, you know, can I have you know stories from women? Some women who'd been abused in the workplace thirty-seven years ago and never told their story to anyone are finally coming forward, going, "I feel like now I can tell my story." Mm. So the platforms are now there mm. for people to come forward. I also think with the with the Royal Commission, that's really sort of opened. Um, just the public psyche in general up about this. Like obviously it's not in the same exact sphere, but it's it's abuse. So it's it's people are getting used to the conversation around it, which is a good thing because Absolutely. it's a good it's not a good thing that we've had to have these conversations, but no. <laughs> but it's a good thing that um, a lot of the stigmas are starting to drop off around it. And yeah, and, it's... and look, one of the best things for someone in that situation to do is be able to talk to a trusted friend or confidant, and whether that's a family member. A professional like a financial advisor mm. or somebody else that you know they know and trust that you know if, if things get really bad they can go and you know sleep on their couch for a week or mm. you know just have someone to talk to about their situation and look if we don't know the answers don't pretend we do mm. maybe do some research and say look I've, fa- I've found a shelter or I found a hotline mm. or I don't know what to do I've never been in that situation mm. but showing the empathy and yep. saying look I hear you. Yep. Um, and look, let's either tackle this together or look for some solutions. Yeah. Well, on that, I was just thinking, what are what are the what are the action points that advisors so they identify that something's going on? I suppose from what you're saying, it's yeah that use your your relationship to understand more. But then, what do they do? What are the action options that they can take? Well, one of the um, options we have now within the licensee I'm with, we actually have to identify if someone's a politically exposed person or a vulnerable person. Yep. And one of the vulnerable questions asks, are they finan- we think they're financially abused. Yep. So we actually now have to report that back to the license. Okay. So I think... So the licensee is coming in to support absolutely. that so next step. Framework. ask your licensee, do they have a plan of action? What do mm. we do when we find it? I know there was um, an advisor in the group I'm with who's also an accountant who a gentleman turned up with his mother, who he knows has dementia, Mm -hmm. and wanted to take money out of her account, and he Mm -hmm. had a new power of attorney drawn up. And his first call was to the solicitor going, how could you possibly have drawn up a new power of attorney with this woman who's not able, you know, she doesn't have capacity. Mm -hmm. And he just said to the guy flat out, I'm not giving you the money. This is invalid as far as I'm concerned, and I'll be calling your solicitor. Mm -hmm. So up to us to be the strong ones. And that's not always an easy... No. thing to do um, but also making sure our dealer group has plans in place so if mm. we don't know what to do mm. call your licensee if you run your own license do you have a plan have mm. you put something in place have you done your research you know it might just be call the hotline and say what do I do this is the situation yep. I don't know how to respond to this again it may be do nothing it may be monitor it may be dob it in if it's fraud mm. you know there's there's always something that we can do but understanding our options i think is going to be really important going forward well it really really plays back into the whole advisors are across everything essentially and uh it's really good in a lot of respects in our ability to influence great outcomes for clients but with that you get the responsibility that we take on is important and like often we're the only ones that can actually identify these things mm. So it it is hard because there are a lot of these little things that can happen, but they they're not they don't happen often. But to have an action plan in place is so yeah. important, and it's sad that we have to. Yeah. But, yeah, knowing what to do is is vital for us as well. So yeah, so I guess I guess the tips out there for anyone that's wondering, like they don't shit, I don't know what I do if um, is to reach out to your dealer group 
Um, I'm sure Amanda would be happy to take a yeah, message. Yeah, look up the the one eight hundred number. Up. Give them a call and go. Look, this is what I do for a living. Mm. I've no idea what to do if I find mm. someone in this situation. Can you help me put a plan together? Mm. So, well, and also probably like uh, there might be a couple of tips in Amanda's course that comes out. That's yes, it. yeah, doing some filming this coming week. So yeah. hopefully you'll be meeting people who've um, been in these situations and gotten out. One is a, a lovely lady who's in the industry currently as a BDM who's. Yep third husband tried to murder her for financial reasons that's yeah. as deep as it gets yeah. uh, i'll be interviewing tanya who i mentioned early yep. the journalist mm-hmm. um you know these these aren't battered cowed women these are strong women who were savvy financially so mm. it's really interesting you know how do you go down that rabbit hole mm. where do you, get you end up in this situation so you know, we're not just talking about the woman on Centrelink who might get a payout and somebody's preying on her. This mm. this just covers all aspects. It makes much more sense to prey on someone with money. You get a much better payoff totally. if you do it. Yeah. So there's there's some interesting situations. Also, uh, Georgia Lane, who was a BDM with One Path, okay. she's doing marketing now. Her grandfather was financially abused okay. by uh, his adopted daughter, and it was one of the very first cases in Australia where a power of attorney was sued for abuse of their powers because it doesn't happen very often. Mm. So there'll be some interesting stories coming out. You yeah, know, I, I, like when I when I talk to you about like, hey, Amanda, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> well, not cool, but like it's a really important topic. thing, the yeah. interesting topic. I think people need to know about it more. I wasn't actually envisaging this, but this is fantastic. Like to get <laughs> yeah. because I think Real like life. obviously there's you could talk about it academically and go, well, yeah, this is what happens, da da da. da. But the stories are going to really, I think, help people understand the significance and maybe probably um, really open up their minds around who who is a, who is a potential victim. Mm. Because I think yeah, it's easy to sort of go, oh, well, they probably look like this, and this is the sort of yeah. There's there's no set formula for what somebody looks like in this space. It's mm. that's for sure. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm so stoked that you're putting it together. Yeah, it's it's been um, a really interesting journey to go down that path, and I'm grateful to Tanya for opening my eyes, um, my naive, privileged life that I've lived and not been exposed to that. Very thankful for that, mm. but to know that people do, and that you know we we have the opportunity to help them. So that's a cool thing too. Yeah. Well, and you were mentioning before you, you're going down a bit of a specialization path. It sounds like um, with one of your businesses. You... Yeah. So at trusted aged care was one that I launched a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. um, more giving strategic or strategy advice into what the costs will be if you're looking at care, mm-hmm. but it also raises these other areas. Mm. Um, well, so I suppose it's part of that whole assessment process. That... Yeah. Because these people are vulnerable. Mm. Um, nearly everybody you deal with, you know, you're dealing with the power of attorney. Sometimes you never meet the actual client. Yeah. Well. So it is a, a specialist area and knowing what you're looking at. And look, money changes people. That's It's an awful truth. Mm. I'm, I'm sure we've all got somebody in our family who we think, yeah, that's, that's the one that's going to cause the trouble <laughs> when, mm. when the will comes. Um, so... You know, there's there's usually a reason. You know, the person's either just plain greedy, or they've got bills, or they've they've got a habit, of, mm. you know, an addiction of some sort, whether it's gambling or drugs or whatever. And that you know, there's there's an opportunity that they're going to exploit. Mm. So that's a, that's a huge area in the aged care space as well. That powers of attorney can do that. So advisors really need to be on on their toes when they're giving advice in in any area, really. But it's going to be more so in the aged care space. Yeah, so in the aged care space, um, like if advisors haven't had much experience in that space and they come across clients, what are, what would you say that just their the next steps are around that space? Obviously, there's specialists that they can refer them to that could support that um, process. Yeah, look, it's it's an area that if, if you're not going to do it often or you don't know much about it or do it well, definitely refer to someone who has done the specialist course. Mm. Louise Biddy runs aged care steps yep. and people come out of that with a specialist accreditation I believe aged care gurus also do something similar. So mm-hmm. call your licensee, ask if there's someone who specialises or, you know, ask around, do your yeah. research. Throw something on the Facebook yep. group. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, if you're looking for someone in that space and, yeah, put it, leave it to the professionals. Mm. Um, it's an area that's easy to muck up. It's yeah. very complicated. What's well, so uh, such a significant commitment with some of these homes, like the contractual agreements. Mm. And if it's not structured right from the start, then... It and can there really... can be up to four levels of daily fees that are paid 
as well yeah, wow. to the home. So good business, some of these uh, aged care homes. Well, I am um, on the Gold Coast, which we lovingly refer to as God's waiting room. So yes. <laughs> I figured it was the perfect opportunity yeah. to start the aged yeah. care space it's, in this area. So. It's a pretty logical step for a niche. Yeah, so from Tweed <laughs> up to Sunshine Coast, it's you know it's a beautiful area for retirees to be. Why wouldn't you want to be here? So, so, um, so you, your destination of going out is um, like a the bowls <laughs> bowls club. Is that the? <laughs> that could be my next target market. Yeah, if I want a niche. <laughs> it's funny we had. Um, we had Michael back talking about uh, one of his clients um, that he started to work with and um, as an advisor that ended up specialising in um, medicos um, and like hosp- people that work in hospitals. And he asked him, like, where do, where do you go your clients? And he took him up and literally he had one client in the hospital and he just kept on going to visit that client. And as people became familiar with him, they were just all of a sudden he he ended up getting this whole hospital and that's like his whole client base perfect yeah and he's like a celebrity in there that was it was really cool actually just turns up with popcorn says hi to everybody yeah maybe you just need to pick one one rsl and that's yeah. it got me thinking now have a couple of drinks Hot just tip, so. yeah exactly and sit around the vets and the cost of beer is that place those places are yeah great. pretty low if only yeah. i liked beer Ah, well, I'm sure I can do a gin and tonic. Or... I'm sure they can, yeah, <laughs> martini or something. That's a... Yeah, I'm not sure how they'd go at mixing the Cosmos at the RSL. <laughs> Maybe just keep it, yeah, soda, tonic and, tonic, tonic <laughs> and gin. Vodka, soda, yeah, something easy. Yeah, cool. And what what else has been happening? Is there, is there um, other, like you're, you're a passionate person, you like to get involved in things. You're talking about MDRT. Is there is there things that, um, that are coming up around that space that... Yeah, so MDRT this year is in Miami, Florida. Um, lucky enough to be on a, a panel discussion there with some other women, at just about women in advice, so mm-hmm. that should be fun. And I will be doing a 20-minute presentation in the what they call the connection zone on financial abuse, so obviously becoming a bit of a thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the first year ever we're having a global meeting in Sydney. The okay. current... Um, president of mdrt global is um based in brisbane okay so i have an australian president and our first global meeting so the international that international conference yeah we're going to have one in sydney in september under three at the icc so that's very exciting um when when's that again september one to three at the icc okay yeah, you're gonna have to put me in touch with all the cool peeps that would be because, oh, like, totally. for a podcast, like these, <laughs> yes. some of the guys, the people that'd be coming over would be phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, so and they're all so willing to share, which yeah. is really great. So okay. yeah, you happy to, have to do that. Do an MV, MDRT special. So <laughs> Done yeah. special podcasting for all the international visitors. Yeah, cool. And, and does it go over a few days? What's the? Yeah, it's it's a few days. So the volunteers usually kick in and get there the Saturday Sunday to set up and make the experience right for everybody. Everybody volunteers their role, so from welcoming the guests, first timers, um, it's it's very much about spirit of giving and mm. volunteering. So MDRT is great with that. So first time we'll have the two in a year, which is really exciting. Um, the other thing that's my passion that's really exciting is the Hunger Project that I've yeah. worked with quite a few times. Yep. So that came about from a connection with Business Chicks. That's mm-hmm. Australia's biggest networking group for women. We probably sent heard of them. Emily down there to check it out because they've done an amazing job at how they engage with their community. Yeah, they do. So Emma took it from a little group with, you know, 8,000 people when it was aligned to Kids Help Line to now, you know, 50,000 paid members, probably a few hundred thousand on the database. And yeah. They get such brilliant speakers out. So I've been lucky to hear everyone from Geldof to Richard Branson, Ariana Huffington, yeah, well. Amy Cuddy, Magda Zabanski. They've just, you know, whoever it is, they've, they've got them coming out. They've now got the guy who wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a, a Fluff, mm-hmm. uh, Mark Manson. <laughs> <laughs> keep it PG. Yeah. Uh, he's coming out soon. Julie Bishop's, you know, about to tour. So, cool. yeah, it's it's a great group and they were aligned with, the Hunger Project. So I'd see, you know, at the events, these videos of these ladies who'd go off to, you know, check out countries like Ethiopia and that mm. sort of stuff. And I thought, oh, wow, good on them. You know, that's that's lovely. And then Emma sort of said to me one day, like, why don't you do it? And I sort of went, well, um, my, you know, experience with philanthropy at that stage was giving a bag of clothes to the op shop or $20 to the Surf Lifesavers. That, mm. that was about it. I didn't know yep. anything about philanthropy and... The idea of having to raise ten thousand dollars fundraising when I've mm-hmm. never done that, plus find five thousand dollars to cover my own costs for the trip on top, mm-hmm. was beyond daunting. So I had a lot of excuses why I shouldn't do that, but 
I gave it a lot of thought and I didn't have a really good reason. Mm. So I took that leap of faith and went, I'm just going to do it, <laughs> put it out there. So, yeah, ended up doing my first trip to Uganda in um, 2015. And it just, I suppose, blew my mind. It opened my eyes to how truly grateful we should be for the beautiful country we live in. You know, most of these countries are surviving on 500 US um, a year. So a mm. dollar a day is their average wage. You know, they're breaking rocks breaking their backs in agriculture um, and yet they're being educated to get themselves out of poverty Mm. and that mindset shift just blew me away that you Mm. know if anyone's got an excuse to be miserable Mm. you know years of civil war strife generations of poverty it's always been this way it's always going to be this way you know they'd have Mm. every reason to just go someone needs to fix it for me but they're turning around going you know what if it's going to be it's up to me and just that just blew me away that, you know, they're willing to learn, turn things around, become entrepreneurs. Mm. So I love that so much. Um, went and visited the gorillas afterwards, which was oh, really cool. The silverbacks. <laughs> yes, I did. So, so cool. climbed the mountains there to look for the silverbacks. Then went to Malawi the following year. How yeah, cool's Malawi? Pretty amazing. They're pretty friendly folks down there. They yeah. really are, yeah. And then yeah. went for a dive in Lake Malawi at the end of that trip. I did so, as well. Yeah, combined. I got a bit a scared because of- <laughs> they, um, they said that you can get these, like, Parasites that yeah you can and they had to take tablets for them like we where we prevent. went we weren't sort of in that area like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's around I was like, people oh, in the riverbeds that's is it worth it like, yeah. <laughs> it was amazing <laughs> yeah they said don't piss yeah <laughs> <laughs> because the parasites go into the snails that yeah, yeah. it's really, <laughs> really I was like, oh don't tell me anyone just, <laughs> just, uh, like. well there hadn't been any crocodiles in Malawi Lake for twenty years until the day before we got there. So oh, that was the first sighting, <laughs> was, was the it? First sighting <laughs> the day before my dive. So <laughs> I figured, oh well, that's an interesting way to go. She got taken by a Nile crocodile in Lake Malawi. So. Did you try the? Um, they've got uh, shook sh- shook a shake. Like it's like their local beer, but it's like a milky sort of thing. No, I didn't get shook shaka. Oh, oh, it was okay. it was interesting. It was a local. It's like having a milkshake beer. I don't know. One of my favourite ads over there was for Heineken beer and it had a rabbit next to it and it would say, probably the best beer in the world. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> that was the... I don't know why the rabbit... I'm not going to go all in, probably. but it's probably, probably. the best beer. <laughs> well, that's what Heineken That was the legal to department telling him, well, we can't claim <laughs> it, but the best. probably is okay. Probably, probably is right. So. That's then awesome. I, yeah, so then um, signed up to do India, um, yeah. which... It was a completely different um, format so they, in India. So they run these programs and they uh, yeah, so organise they have for you? Four business chicks. They'll take up to 20 women. The next yep. trip they're doing is to Ghana, which okay. I'm so jealous. It would be amazing. Um, and they also have leadership tours for people outside of business chicks. So entrepreneurs who want to expand their leadership game, they'll take up to 20 people to you know Uganda or Ghana or some yeah. amazing place. And it's not about us sharing our leadership journey. It's about learning from these people yeah. who are turning their lives around. So you are learning these lessons from the most unlikely of leaders mm. who, you know, just you're so humbled coming away from that experience. I always find it the irony around like like they, you look at like the happiness index sort of thing and these ratings that um, like it's the economist does. Third and world, the, isn't it? <laughs> and like and the, the sort of statistics you're talking about in terms of income and relative to over here and like. They're happier. Yeah. yeah. Like it's... Simpler life. Yeah. yeah. It's... Um, They're nearly always the third world countries and, yeah, the low incomes. And even just from that, there's a lot to learn just by having to think about, hmm, why is that the case? Yeah. And look, you, you don't have to go on these journeys to understand that. Mm. But I think seeing it firsthand, own eyes, meeting the people, you know, just rubbing shoulders with them and hearing their stories firsthand, it just gives you that whole other take on... What's out there? And it puts a perspective on everything here, you know. Life's tough right now. The you, know, you listen to the media, our businesses are worth nothing, our clients hate us, you know, businesses we know it's over, you know, our lives are ruined. <laughs> and, you know, I've already heard there's been suicides in the industry, there's people on watch. Mm. You know, we're so busy tying our self-worth to our net worth, mm. not realising, you know, let's take it back to basics. Mm. This is a service-providing industry that we do we do add value to our clients some of our clients do really love us Mm. for what we do you know so it's really important to just have that perspective get our head out of the negativity you know realize our value and that we are so lucky to do what we do and you know if we can't do this anymore there's other opportunities 
Mm. It doesn't matter. As long as we can make ends meet, whether it's Uber driving or, you know, there is life beyond planning for people who choose to go. Yeah, um, totally. So it's, it's nice to just have that, that global view of, you know, life's good. <laughs> Travel has been, is the best teacher as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, um, it shows you how truly blessed we are to be here. Hmm. On, that note, on that note. On that note. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, looking forward to seeing the course. And yeah. Stay tuned for that one. Shouldn't be too long. Awesome. Thank you.